Yeah, I see it. Mike, we start doing the admitting because I want to start talking. Hi, everyone. This is Cynthia with the North San Joaquin uh, Valley, <laughs> North San Joaquin Valley chapter of, of CMPS. And um, I do want to ask you a question before we get going. Our, our, our speaker has asked um, me to ask you a question. What happened? Here it is. Um, which is, uh, if you could do in the in the chat window, just do a short intro. And if you could name your favorite plant. Or you can plant. Um, if you're, what chapter are you from? If any, you don't have to be. Um, what was the other thing, Jim? Um, just uh, if there's anything specific you're hoping to get out of the presentation tonight. Okay. Okay. What are you looking to get out of the presentation? Okay, great. All right. So I'm going to start now. We have quite a few people in the meeting. 37 people, which is great. Um, so this is our uh, webinar series of the North San Joaquin Valley CMPS. This is our ninth webinar. Um, we do have a, a website now. If you want to go to our website at some point and see what we're doing, you can go there. We also have a Facebook page, and that has a lot of information, too. Our speaker tonight is Jim Breger, who was uh, has been the uh, he's a past president of our chapter, and he's currently the treasurer. And his topic, which is very exciting for us that live in the Central Valley, is landscape design with California native plants. Let me ask you a question. I'll ask this question verbally. How many of you already have a native plant garden, even if it's just three plants? Why don't you just put that in there? Okay, so we're at, at the agenda part of our program. Um, this is me, Cynthia Tipaldos. I run these webinars. Um, and we're just going to talk about our, our webinar series and getting started. So next, uh, after I talk for a few minutes, Mike Azevedo is going to talk about our chapter and about CMPS in general. Because not all of you are members of our chapter or of CMPS, and you might want to know more about it. Then I'll introduce Jim, and then Jim will talk, which is the main event. We do record all of these um, events, and we upload to our YouTube page. Our channel name is NSJV underscore CNPS. And you can look at our Facebook page and our website for the new webinar announcements. The past webinars, I'm not going to, I'm going to very briefly tell you what they all are. Biodiversity in the native plant garden or reliable California native plants for a garden with no irrigation. Planning and growing a California native plant garden, inspirational anting public lands of California Central Valley, basic botany, floral displays, vernal pools, and the La Loma community native plant garden of Modesto. So they're, most of them are pretty focused on the Central Valley or their kind of general types of things like basic botany. Um, the upcoming webinars are, of course, today, Landscape Design with California Native Plants in the Central Valley. Uh, next month is Bryophyte Basics, and I didn't know what bryophytes were. But I, I kind of think I know how to spell it, but 
I don't know, I might, might fail in the future. And so we have actually one of the members of the Briarfoot chapter will be speaking in August, uh, Native Plants of the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge and, wild, and the benefits to wildlife. And of course you can go there. This is very close to those of us that are in the Central Valley, at least in the San Joaquin Valley. Then we're gonna do part two of reliable California native plants for garden with no irrigation because uh, Christoph only got through the first part. This was an extremely popular uh, talk. And so he was gonna finish that up. Um, you can go back and you can go look at part one. Then in October, in October, we're gonna talk about plants and fish. And then in November, just in time for the holidays, creating wreaths with the native plants by Cynthia Gingerich, who's a good friend of mine and wonderful photographer and um, floral creator for us. Okay, do no webinar in December. This is our YouTube channel. We've had 3,000 views so far. We have several playlists, 110 subscribers. Um, and this one playlist specifically for these webinars, we also do other things which are on there too. This is just more about our webinar series. So remember, they're all, they're all recorded. Everything you say, everything is being recorded. Everything you type in the chat. Um, they're typically, and so far, they've all been on the second Monday evening of each month. Um, if you have an idea for a webinar, just something you want to hear about, um, or you want to be a speaker, let me know. Just email me, and I'm sure if, you know, if it's relevant, we'll find a way to make that happen. Okay, now I'm going to turn this over to Mike. Uh, Mike, you want to take the screen? Yeah, let me see if I can do that. Um, let's see. Uh, let me go share. Oh, do you want to go ahead and make me a? Oh, yeah. I guess I can. Never mind. I, I it turned out that uh, it was warning me I was going to take it away from you. Um, do you see it? Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Um, I um I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> do, do you want to, Jeannie, if you have something, you, you want to go ahead and type it into the, the chat and uh, Cynthia can take a look at it. I, I can see your hand is up. Um, I wanted to give you an introduction to our chapter, the North San Joaquin Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. The California Native Plant Society is a statewide organization and you can join it for a regular individual membership of $50 to receive Flora and Artemisia magazines, to get benefits such as discounts at certain nurseries, sales and such, and the ability to join two different chapters of CNPS. If you would like to join North San Joaquin Valley chapter and one other, such as the Santa Clara Valley chapter, the Sacramento chapter, or others, it will be an option when you go to the link on the slides. That's cnps.org slash membership. So um, we hope that you join us here in the North San Joaquin chapter and whichever other chapter you feel a kinship with. I said the membership was $50, but there is an option to choose other price options and higher membership levels for available are available for those who are able to help the organization more financially. It's a great cause. The regular membership link is right there, cnps.org slash membership. Remember, this is the link to join up. And I should point out that the long bar on the bottom uh, of that, um, the thing on the, the right, um, which is what you see when you link, when you sign, uh, sign into that, that uh, cnps.org slash membership, um, that is for other. So um, we used to have something for a, a $25 membership which was for uh, fixed income. And we are just in the process of uh, removing all the labels. So there's no more labels for all the different, um, the different uh, amounts that you would pay for a, a membership. And that includes the low income level. So now all you have to do is uh, click on that, that one, which is you get to put in whatever you want. $25 is actually the minimum now that you would have for uh, for uh, uh, getting your membership. So ordinarily it would be $50. 
If, if you feel that you can't do it for $50, you can put in 25 by using the other. Um, we, and let's see, our fourth edition of our newsletter um, was sent out in May. J volume four of the Oak Branch was sent out to all of our members via email. Um, and this is our 11 our pollinators edition with articles on helping native bees, learning about our local swallowtail butterfly population. And uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little. And a folder page with beautiful views of some beautiful pollinators in uh, Manteca backyard. CC Hurst, our president and big time field trip leader, uh, takes us on a vi virtual video reels of her favorite native plant hangouts. Our conservation committee is finally getting off the ground with our first meeting being held via Zoom tomorrow night, June 13th. If you're interested in attending, let me know in chat and I'll give you the information. Rhonda Allen clues us in on some great fragrant native plants and shows us incredible photos of late spring wildflower, uh, wildflowers in the central foothills. And Cece Hart is leading our field trips and she has been collaborating with the local Audubon and Sierra Club chapters so bring your binoculars because these events are field trips, are events for nature lovers. The Meadows of Yosemite field trip is July 8th at 7.30. 7.30 is when you show up in Oakdale so we can carpool in together. Come travel to the mountains and experience the beauty of forest meadows. This guided tour will introduce you to common wildflowers you can see throughout the park's meadows. We will carpool from Oakdale into the park where we will explore multiple meadows as we drive through the park to Tuolumne Meadows. You're welcome to meet us at the gate or we can carpool to save on gas uh, and the park entrance fee. This will be an all day trip and we will and we'll require walking through unpaved trails. And this is important. Please email cnps.nsj at gmail.com to coordinate if you'd like to go. It's important because the road may not even be open and this event may have to be canceled or modified. So I should also point out that we intend to do everything by email. We recognize that there are some people who actually prefer US mail. And for those who are inconvenienced, we do apologize, but we don't yet have the financial or volunteer base to put the newsletter out that way. We've decided to save some trees and remain electronic. If this is a true problem, let us know. But so far, nobody's actually complained. Um, and if you're on our list, um, our email list, you should have received our newsletter. But if you didn't, if you somehow got missed, let me know in chat. And, and do me a favor, don't, don't let everybody know. Just go ahead and send it directly to me. And to be put on our list, let me know in chat. We want our newsletter to go out to everyone. That's our mission to promote native plants around our region. And our best way of doing that is to keep native plants on everyone's minds through events and presentations and gardening. So we wanna keep those of you who haven't joined the statewide organization in the loop so that perhaps you can join us for an event or two and to remind uh, you that we are here. So why care about native plants? We aren't finding out, we are finding out more and more each day about the true need to restore our environment as much as we can. The man who's been trying to explain this need for native plants with the most eloquence has been Doug Ptolemy, a professor from Delaware. He's written three books on the subject, all of which circle around the theme that we have been damaging our environment dramatically, but there is hope in native plants. 95% of all birds feed insects to their young. Caterpillars are an important component of that diet and caterpillars cannot live on non-native plants with very few exceptions for the, their, their caterpillars. Um, native plants are critical to the ecosystem and a backyard with no native plants, and that is a devastatingly high percentage of them, are ecological dead zones. Planting native plants in our yards helps moths, butterflies, native bees, and other pollinators, and therefore birds, and the web goes on and on. Our city does not need to be devoid of butterflies, moths, and native bees. For more information about this, you can watch a one hour video that knocked me over like a brick. This was a talk sponsored by local Audubon chapters just this past January. I'm gonna put the link in chat in, um, for actually most of the links, the, the stuff that I talked about, all the, I, I gave you a bunch of links and things like that. I'm gonna put that all in chat. So um, 
including the, the link to this YouTube video um, of this Doug Ptolemy talk, okay? And uh, if you have any questions during Jim's presentation, please add them to chat and we'll do all the questions at the end. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Cynthia and I will be in chat for those with questions or comments. Uh, let's see. All right, Cynthia, you're up. Yeah, I know. I'm um, gonna show my screen again. Okay. Um, so our speaker is Jim Abroger. He's uh, our, currently our, uh, a member of our board. He's the treasurer and he's our former president of this chapter. And he's been involved in native plants for a long time. Um, Jim lives, uh, of course, here in the San Joaquin Valley in our, in our chapter area. And I've actually been to his garden and it's gorgeous. It's so, and the design is amazing. So there's really, we've really got a very artistic, creative, and successful person here talking about um, landscape design. Uh, professionally, actually, Jim is a mechanical engineer, and he uh, is a senior mechanical engineer in facilities at UC Merced. So he's got, where's the number of hubs? Um, yeah, he's been in the CNPS since 2005. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to Jim and let's get going. Awesome. Jim, you want to just take the screen for me, please? All right. Yes. Should be up. So hopefully you're seeing the full screen slide. Almost. It says yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad you're here tonight. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks, Cynthia, for putting the pressure on. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I just said, I'm, uh, my background's mechanical engineering, um, and I got uh, kind of involved with this native plant wildness um, back in 2005 when we bought our first house in Turlock, uh, coming over, grew up in Turlock, moved away, came back to the, to the valley, and the first thing I wanted to do was landscape for birds, and didn't know how to do that, so um, evidently did not inherit my dad's green thumb. And um, so I did the sunset garden books, did all the usual stuff you do when you don't know what you're doing. And just by chance, I ran across a um, speaker that was being, um, or a presentation that was being given at the Sacramento Valley chapter um, during one of their plant sales. And it was called Landscaping for Wildlife. And the first time I ever put two and two together and realized, oh wait, native plants, native birds, what a concept. And um, so, just uh, putting those pieces together started me on this road of figuring out what a native plant is and what do we do in the Central Valley. So um, my goal tonight really is to um, kind of go through a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been just my own trial and error and um, experience over the last 10 plus years, just dabbling and figuring out what can handle my abuse and what can handle um, our local valley climate, which is fairly unique actually. Um, and so um, I'm gonna start off basically, I kind of call this one, uh, you know, lawnlessness in the wild west because once we, everybody's talking about turf removal, getting rid of their lawns and then we got rid of it, we turned off the water, now what? Where do we go from here? And so my goal really is to probably just uh, talk a little bit about what Mike just shared about why native plants are so important and what role they play in our landscapes and our, our local habitat. And then um, a little bit about where we start. How do you plan? How do you develop a landscape design for yourself? And then in the end, where does it end? Where do we go? How do we maintain it? Once we get the things in the ground, what do we do next? So um, hopefully hang on for the ride. It should be fun Let's see where we go. I wanted to start off first though, talking about this. I don't know if uh, how many of you have seen this before. It's called the hydro illogical cycle. And really we need to figure out how do we break this cycle? And this is a perfect time, a perfect year to talk about this because right now we're right in the uh, in this spot where we've got rain and we have plenty of rain. Everybody's going back to planting hydrangeas and aster or um, um, <laughs> all this fun stuff that takes lots of water, putting in, putting back their lawns, put, turning on the sprinklers, washing their cars. And then everybody gets apathetic. 
with about a good wet, one or two wet years, and then all of a sudden it starts drying out again. And everybody suddenly becomes a year after about one or two years, everybody's aware, hey, we might be running out of water. And then it gets turns into concern. And eventually, where we were last year, complete panic, where we don't know where the water is going to come from. And then all of a sudden it rains again. And we're in this vicious cycle and it never stops. We think with this much rain, everybody thinks that it's done. We're out of the drought. But just give it five years. We'll have another one coming, I'm sure. So um, trying to break this cycle is really important. I think that's where our landscapes play an important role in this and realizing it is a cycle. Um, you know, typical landscape design focuses primarily on the human aesthetic and what we do to bring value to our own eyes and to our own sense of place and our own sense of um, aesthetic, really. And so everybody, not I shouldn't say everybody, but a vast majority of people like a very manicured look, a very architectural, formal look in their yards. And this is this slide is kind of typical of that. Um, and again, I'm going to quote Doug Tallamy a lot, just like Mike did, because he hit it on the head. It's, you know, we design for beauty without much consideration for the ecological factors that go into our landscape designs. And typically, too, um, traditional landscaping methods tend to change the place to fit a specific plant. If you think about um, hydrangeas, I just mentioned, that's a, that's a really good one. You want, they, they demand that you change the soil composition to fit that plant's needs. They don't give any consideration to what plant would actually fit the soil conditions you have. So whether you've got sand, clay, loam, dry, wet, whatever it is, most traditional ways of thinking is to change that soil or to change that area to fit a specific plant you want. I'm gonna turn that on its head and say, let's find the plants that fit our place. And if we've got a wet area, it's not necessarily a problem. Can it be a resource we could use? So we'll talk about that a little bit. And our idea is to really solve problems with our landscapes. This is one of my favorite comic strips um, uh, by uh, Jeff Millett uh, called Fraz. And I'll just give you guys a minute to read it. I won't read it to you, um, but um, unless maybe it's too small on your screen, then I could read it to you. But the general gist of it is, I love the punchline on this one, is that you know, why do people want where they are to look like where they came from? And in the end, it says some transplants can't adapt and some plant transplants won't. I think that speaks a lot to our mentality when it comes to landscapes, but also the plants themselves that we pick. And it comes back to planting things that want a lot of water, fertilizer, extra care, that if we planted local and planted what belongs here, it wouldn't be a problem. So what do we do when we find out there's a drought? A lot of people go swing the pendulum too far the other way. We plant deserts in areas that aren't deserts. Um, but this does absolutely nothing for aesthetics, doesn't help with watershed. I know here in the valley, it's hard for us to think about being affecting somebody else downstream from us. It's so flat, we don't think there is a downstream. But no matter where you are, unless you're in the ocean, there's a downstream. So looking at how your landscapes affect the watershed, where is that water going? Is it going straight to the gutter? Is it gonna affect storm drains somewhere downstream? Uh, are you doing anything to rebuild soil or to create habitat? Landscapes like this really don't do any of those things. Same thing with mulch and rock. I have neighbors that have done this with their yards and, and they say it's low maintenance or no maintenance. And there is no such thing as no maintenance. Low maybe, but definitely not no maintenance. And again, this does nothing for aesthetics, really helps with nothing with soil building, habitat value, nothing that benefits anything other than the homeowner doesn't wanna do anything. But on the other hand, here's what we can do is we can select plants and create landscape methods that solve problems and put in plants that go naturally with the place and create a relatively beautiful landscape that belongs in that area and also creates a lot of solutions for pollinators, habitat, and the food web. Um, again, to quote Doug Talame in his book, Bringing Nature Home, native plants are the foundations of the ecosystems. Without the food webs, you know, without the, the food source, the plant material, um, and Mike touched on this also, it, we can't um, feed the caterpillars, we can't feed the next generation of um, pollinators, um, you know, 90% of herbaceous insects 
can only eat the plants with which they co-evolve. And I think the monarch butterfly is probably our best example of this. Um, our local monarchs only can use local native milkweed. You can't plant Mexican milkweed. You can't plant some other type of milkweed. It does no good for them whatsoever. Um, and so a lot of other critters out there need those specific plants to, th to thrive and survive. And it's funny because when I was, before I read Doug Talamay's book, I was always thinking about pollinators. And most people, when you ask them, hey, what do you want to attract for pollinators? They want to see butterflies, bees, little you know, flies, wasps, those kind of things, mostly butterflies and bees. But in the end, I always ask when I go to master gardeners and do other talks, I always ask people, how many people want to see things eating their plants? And almost nobody raises their hand. <laughs> they say, oh no, that's not, that's not a good thing. But in this case, Doug Talamay really turned my mind upside down and said, you know, hey, what are we doing to attract the next generation of pollinator? It's great to attract the pollinators the first time, but what are we gonna do to keep them around and to promote that second generation? And that's where the natives really come in and play their, their part. And so what we do, what we plant really does matter in the end. Um, so planting local, um, and I might get in trouble for this one a little bit. Um, obviously the more local you can plant things, if you plant what belongs in your uh, plant community in your zone basically is the best you can do. They perform the best, they can adapt, they're adapted to that climate, to that soil condition, they're adapted to everything else, and they also provide the best food source for and habitat for local wildlife. Um, and you know, the best, biggest thing really is don't plant it invasive. And there's the California Invasive Plant Council, Cal IPC, has a lot of resources available and lists of invasive plants that you want to stay away from. And I think the nursery trade in general, as far as non-natives go, are getting much more uh, well versed and better at sorting out and not selling invasives, but you still have to be careful if you're going to plant non natives. Um, but when it comes to planting local, um, especially in the Central Valley, there's um, two schools of thought on this. You know, certain areas, if you're along the coast, if you're up in certain areas of the mountains, there are definitely areas where there's a genetic population, a very rare genetic endemic population that you've got to be careful of. And like in certain manzanitas, they cross hybridize. And if you plant the wrong manzanita in the wrong place, you can basically wipe out a, a rare DNA species, rare DNA sample of a specific manzanita because of cross hybridization. Um, so in certain areas, it definitely makes sense. You only plant what is found in that location and don't do anything else. That's one that's one side of the pendulum. If you swing it the other way um, a little bit, like here in the Central Valley, we've been ag for so long. And with a few exceptions along riparian corridors in different areas, um, we're really a valley grassland habitat far and wide. There's some oak savanna and riparian corridors, like I said. But generally, um, trying to plant a valley grassland yard here within suburbia is really, really difficult and takes a lot of maintenance. And so um, my school of thought generally is picking what we can from as close of plant communities to this area as possible and figuring out what can handle our heat and cold wet winters in the valley floor without a lot of extra help. Um, so making sure that you hydrozone, which means basically grouping plants by their water needs and understanding your resources. Um, planting local evergreen foundation plants is kind of important. And also just making sure you do spacing. I've seen a lot of plantings go in where things are, people tend to plant too close together or too much and it overcrowds. And it's because you, it's hard to see things like in this picture where there's four or five feet between plants, but know that within three to five years that will be completely full. Some of these natives don't come very small very often. So plan for mature growth. Um, and I'm going to be focusing really a lot on the native plant side of it tonight. And I'm quite frankly, I'm not really well versed in non-native plant material. Um, again, my background is engineering. I just kind of became a plant engineer sort of by uh, dabbling with this for the last 10 plus years. Um, but uh, things like salvia gregii are fantastic. They generally are not invasive. Um, they handle very similar conditions in the valley that some natives that do well here like so they do blend well with um, with natives and um, the salvia can be a great hummingbird plant 
So there's uh, definitely certain plants that go very well together with natives. And so blending them together and creating that more maybe human aesthetic a bit does have its place, um, but just do it with caution. And again, just remember there's no substitute really for native plants to, in supporting our wildlife. I'm gonna shift gears um, just a little bit. Um, the uh, getting into landscape design a little bit and how do you how do you start? So again, if you're at, at home and you're trying to figure out, you're looking at your front yard and going, man, what do I do? Where do I start? How do I do this thing? Or even your backyard. Um, I'm gonna try to go through this pretty fast, actually. There's a lot here to cover, but hopefully it's enough to get you off of top dead center and help you maybe work toward getting your own plan developed. Um, and basically it's a five-step process. You start with a site survey where you get a piece of graph paper or something, you get a tape measure and a pencil, go out and mark out your boundaries, take measurements, um, accurate measurements as much as possible. And it doesn't have to be to the quarter inch, it can be within five or six inches, you're fine. Um, mark all fixed objects, utilities, anything that needs to stay around and do as best you can to make an accurate site survey. Once you get that, you convert it into a base plan and make notes on that base plan. So you wanna create a scaled plan. That's why I use graph paper. Um, scale it off and make a base plan and make notes on it with what views do you want to keep? Do you have views out certain windows that you wanna maintain? Uh, what elements do you wanna remove? Do you have a tree or do you have something that needs to be dealt with and removed? What do you wanna keep? Um, I was doing a landscape for a person that needed, uh, had a couple of ginormous redwoods that they wanted to keep. They were beautiful, they weren't hurting anything. Um, I don't recommend them in the valley, but in this case, they wanted to stay in place. And so we kept those and used them as a resource and figure out how to design around those. Uh, what challenges are there? Do you have low spots? Do you have wet spots? Um, resources, you know, do you have mounds? Do you have any topography to deal with? My favorite one, his neighboring excess. You know, how many of uh, us have neighbors that just completely overwater and it creates a wet spot on your yard? It's like, to me, that's a resource. Use their water bill to water and to put in something that uses more water perhaps. Um, so make notes of all those and just scratch around and, and, and just make notes and uh, bubble out what you want to do and what you want to see. And then move on to the uh, bubble plan. And a bubble plan really is brainstorming. Uh, figuring out the uses. Do you have areas where you may want to have a little patio or a little seating area? Do you want, do you need a play space? Do you need space for dogs, for kids? Um, you know, turf grass isn't the best idea in the world, but if you have kids or if you have a use for it and you need it, then put it in. Um, if you don't have a need for it, then take it out. And then what style of landscape are you looking for? Do you want a little bit more formal? Do you want to take a walk on the wild side? Um, Really, it's you know just brainstorming, just getting ideas out and putting them in bubble form. And I always recommend getting a, a roll of onion skin or uh, tracing paper. Basically, they sell them in rolls at um, like Staples and those places. And just use it as scratch paper, and because you can trace over your base plan without having to redraw it all the time. And it makes it very quick to create bubble plans. And then from the bubble plan, you move to the concept plan where you start defining those spaces, you put in shape and give size to them. You take the, basically take the bubbles and make them more formal and scale them and put them in the right size. And then if you're moving into more detailed plans and uh, if you want to actually do cost estimates, irrigation plans, that kind of thing would be part of that stage. And then from there at the end, the final stage is really creating an accurate scaled plan that is what you will implement or have a contractor come out and put in the ground. Um, final plant selections, make sure you have the quantities, the types and sizes, the different landscape materials. If you have boulders, if you have um, mulch, anything like that you're putting in, rock, whatever it is. And then if you're doing irrigation systems, if you have to do a massive irrigation rem uh, remake or <laughs> makeover, um, then I recommend hiring a professional to do that. Um, there are certain contractors and different people are um, licensed to do irrigation systems and it does make a difference in the end. It's just really hard to find people that are well-versed in irrigating for natives. Um, and we'll talk about that hopefully in a little bit if I remember. Um, so just real quick, just kind of backing up, this is a con an idea of a bubble plan where you basically highlight out 
your uses. In this case, this person, we wanted a seating area back here in the corner. And we just kind of sketched in a couple ideas of paths going out there. We had a shade area. Um, this area was really wet up in the front corner and they wanted something. We figured out we could use that as a resource because the neighbors overwatered and just the slope of the topography made this pretty much wet almost all the time. And so we turned it into a possible dry creek feature. Um, so those are the kind of things you want to keep in mind when you're running, laying out a bubble plan. And then one thing is, uh, as we um, try to create this balance between traditional horticulture practice and landscape design practice and the native plant aspect to it. And again, if you think about this as a pendulum, you really have on one side, you've got the traditional landscape methods with decorative values, screens, focal points, anchors. And traditionally that tends to overpower and outweigh the habitat value. If you take it too far the other way and just go for food web value and you plant exactly, you know, you, like in our case, if you plant a valley grassland habitat, which would be perfect for this area, then you've got your HOA, you have your neighbors to worry about and you have the maintenance and other things to worry about. So trying to balance these two is a challenge, especially in the Central Valley. Um, it can be a, a bit of a hard task to ask depending on what you're trying to plant and how much extra work you wanna put into it. So as you're moving through the, the design process, um, you start thinking about plant selections. Do you wanna think about characteristics? How much habitat value do they offer? What kind of um, sun exposure do they, and how much water do they need? Are there colors that you're looking for specifically that you wanna to match together? Um, with your siting conditions, considerations, you wanna think about, again, hydrozoning, making sure you put plants with similar water use together. Um, like, for instance, you wouldn't necessarily put a desert willow or a Palo Verde tree in the same zone as a, um, I'm just trying to think offhand, um, like a um, monkey flower, um, like a riparian monkey flower, because they have completely different water requirements. What is the mature size? This is one uh, I always say, do as I say, not as I do, because I've been notorious for planting things that according to all the, the books and Calscape and everything else, it says this thing gets somewhere between three to 12 feet. And I planted somewhere where it's on the, it needs like more like three feet, ends up getting 12 feet and I have to keep trimming it back and I end up killing it. So be very cognizant of the mature size of the plants. Try not to overcrowd and put things where they don't belong. Um, again, do as I say, not as I do. Um, and then foundations, usually, again, just kind of going into traditional uh, landscape architecture, um, evergreen foundation plants are pretty typical and they create that kind of background um, uh, screen, if you will. And then plant, the most important thing I find is I try to plant by plant community. Again, you wouldn't put a desert willow with a yarrow or with a golden currant because they're not really found in the same plant communities. So if you're going to do more of a desert-ish type landscape, um, again, cacti and succulents probably aren't the right answer for this region because we're uh, Mediterranean, we're not desert yet. Um, but I would say, you know, if you're gonna do that kind of thing, you can put things like desert willow with mallows or, and with um, bladder pod. They're found generally in the same proximity to each other and they go together. And then you can transition your yard from that more dry desert like climate over to another part of the yard where you might have more of a woodland type thing with ceanothus, toyon, um, golden currents, things like that, depending on how much water you have and what resources you have. And again, think about maintenance. There again, nothing is low maintenance or no maintenance, but there is low maintenance. And so if you give the plants the space they need, um, you might have to deadhead once or twice a year, but there shouldn't be any continual weekly maintenance with most native plants if done with correctly. Um, a few resources that will help you in plant selections. If you're looking for non-natives, of course, the Western Garden Book is a good resource. Um, Calscape, Blossom Hill Natives, Las Palitas Nursery, Xerxes Society, all of those have fantastic references and are great resources to help you pick um, native plants that are good for your specific area. Um, Master gardeners are also a good resource to help with figuring things out. 
Um, and again, California based the plant council to help you figure out what not to plant is also a good thing. Um, and so in the end, this is an example of a working plan. So when you get it all together, it's all scaled out and all the plants are picked and put out to scale. This is the final plan that you would go in and implement potentially. Pardon me. So as we're moving into, uh, we figured out the plan, we know what we want to do. Now, how do we get it in the ground? Where do we start? Um, so really, you need to look at your existing conditions. What type of lawn and plants are present? What are you going to be removed? What's going to remain? Um, and what kind of soil do you have? Do you have clay? Is it compacted? Uh, is, it so, is it sandy? There's uh, in our house here in Denair, it was pretty amazing because I have never seen as compact as much compaction as I saw when we moved in here 12 years ago. Um, I actually bent a mattock trying to break through the top layer of, of dirt over here. It was nasty, and we have really bad clay, um, or in my case, good clay. I actually like the clay. But um, is there any existing ir irrigation you have to deal with? Pipe modifications. Um, all of that you just need to kind of be aware of and figure out what you have to work with and where you start. And so when we're going to take the lawn out, we have a couple of different ways to do it. You can put sweat equity into it and do manual removal. That works well and is pretty much good for almost any, every type of turf or issue you have to deal with. Manual removal, again, just takes a lot of time and effort. You could use sod cutters, but only if you have relatively low um, short rooted fescues and, and turf grass type stuff. If you have Bermuda at all or any nasty weeds with deep roots um, or rhizomes, rhizomas type roots, any of those, um, the sod cutters and that kind of stuff will not work long term. Bermuda is one of the nastiest things ever. And I know a lot of people are really gun shy and don't really want to use herbicides. But if you have Bermuda, the only way to get really rid of it is to nuke it. You've got to spray it pretty much. Um, and uh, when I was talking to Bert Wilson at Las Palitas when I first was trying to figure this native plant thing out, I had Bermuda and that was his, he didn't even hesitate. He said, spray it and bury it. And uh, sure enough, it, it actually worked. So um, you can also do solarization. It's kind of hit or miss whether it works. There's some drawbacks to solarization. Um, it will kill the grass, but it also kills everything within the first couple of inches of top spill. And so it really does no good for building soil and keeping the microbes alive. So it's kind of a last resort and you really need to have full blazing sun in order to make it work. If you have any shade at all, it really won't be very effective. Um, sheep mulching, the, the picture in the bottom left is actually my front yard when I finally decided to get rid of what little lawn I had. And so I did some a combination of manual removal around the perimeter and then buried it under cardboard and four inches of bark mulch. And that has worked very, very well. I had no Bermuda, so it actually worked very well in that case. You can use uh, newspaper. The image on the right is using a newspaper with mulch, but seven layers of newspaper, or if you get clean cardboard, that works as well. So um, when you come to install it, after you got the turf gone, then you can start laying out your installation. And first thing to start with is hardscape. There's nothing worse than trying to put in hardscape after you put in all the paid for and put on all your plants and then you got to kill half of them trying to get your hardscape in. So get your pathways marked out, um, any sidewalks, anything that you need to do, pathways, get all that stuff in first. It's way easier to plant around them than trying to plant through them. Um, get any large boulders in place, anything that requires large equipment, make sure you do that first. And then start with the plan. When you have your plants, just start following the plan and placing them out and let your um have some confidence in yourself and just basically if you, something doesn't look right or you think it needs to move a couple of feet move it um just because you have a plan doesn't mean it's set in stone that is just an idea it's a concept to help you get off the top dead center and just let your creativity flow as you see it come to life out in your yard start moving stuff around and figure out how you like it to look um and if you have a very large project you might have to think about it in phases and don't be afraid to phase the thing uh, you may just want to make sure that if you do any removal like lawn and that kind of thing that you get most of that out ahead of time. Bark mulch um, or even rock mulch if you're doing more of a desert theme is relatively easy to push out of the way and plant through. So 
um, you know, do as much prep work as you can early on. Mulch looks generally okay and is pretty easy for maintenance until you're ready to plant plants. And the planting methods for natives um, are pretty simple, actually. Um, the one thing I, I like to do if I'm in person, I always like to, to get a reaction to this because I always make sure people know the first most important thing when planting any plant at all is make sure you plant it green side up. That's a good thing. Um, but basically, this is taken straight from Las Palitas' website. You dig a hole, make sure the crown's just a little bit above the plant. You backfill it with native soil, tamp it really good. I usually just give it a good womp with my foot and you mulch heavily around it, making sure you leave some space around the crown so it doesn't rot and then give it a really good, good, long, deep water. And basically after that, if you just stick your finger in the ground about an inch or so down, if it's dry, give it a shot of water. If it's wet, don't touch it. And after the first one to two years, it really should need no supplemental irrigation after that. Um, and I, when I talk to garden clubs and different things, I always make sure I point out that if you notice on this list, the, the one thing that's missing is fertilizer and soil amendment. With natives, you do not want to amend the soil generally. Um, most natives, if picked appropriately for the place, really can survive with native soil without any supplemental help and nutrients. And actually most native plants for this region really don't like soils that are too rich or too wet. Um, so that can actually be detrimental to the plants as well. So now that we've got it in the ground, you know, what are we going to do? Um, we've got to deal with maintain maintenance, weed control, pruning, that kind of thing. Seasonal deadheading is important. Um, if there's any weeds that pop up, if you do have Bermuda, there's very light and it's not very likely you'll get rid of it the first time. So I always try to make sure I leave plenty of room around the plant. Got then make sure I get all the rhizomes out from where I'm putting the plant in the ground. And if anything does pop up, you can either just spot treat it with a little bit of herbicide or dig it up if you, if you can get to it. Um, but basically watering, there's a couple schools of thought on watering. Most plants for our region really don't like drip. Uh, if you look at Las Palitas' website, they talk about how most native plants really don't wanna be living in a bog unless they're riparian. And drip tends to break, create a very wet, hot zone right around the root ball, and it kills a lot of natives. So overhead watering is generally a little bit better. Micro sprays are fantastic. Um, I like Bert Wilson's concept of doing beer can watering, he calls it, where in the time it takes you to drink a soda or a beer, you can hand water most of your landscape in. Um, and generally, if picked appropriately, if you plant in the fall and we get a good wet winter, um, the first year, Plants will probably want to drink every few weeks, uh, two to three weeks maybe. Again, depending on your soil, if you have clay or sand, you might need a little bit more if you have sand. But after the first one and a half to two years, the plants should be relatively self-sufficient if you've um, picked your plants appropriately. Um, and then I challenge you too, once you have figured this out and once you've started getting involved in, and experimenting with native plants and you've created your own native habitat garden, then get out and share it. Talk to your neighbors about why it's so important and what value you're bringing to the, to the landscape. And then, um, yeah, there's other resources, Master Gardeners, Garden Clubs, and California Native Plant Society with the Garden Ambassador Program are all great avenues to share these things out. Um, I'll just roll through real, real quick a few of um, some of my favorite things um, that I have in my yard. This is a picture of my front yard a few years ago. It's filled in since now, since then, and it's um, much more wild looking today. But um, Ceanothus in general, there's a number of varieties of them. In the back of the picture on the left is actually a um, Ceanothus, a large tree form, a large shrub type Ceanothus called Frosty Blue. That's fantastic. It's about a 10 to 15 foot shrub. Um, the one in the front is called Joyce Coulter Ceanothus. It's supposed to be a ground cover. This particular one went vertical and ended up being about three and a half, four feet tall. Um, I just planted another one. Uh, this one I had to come out because it wasn't in a good location. I didn't plant it correctly, but I put another one in and it is staying low as a ground cover, but beautiful, beautiful blue blooms um, to purple and one of the best bee attractors I've ever seen. Fairly short-lived blooms, but it's just awesome. And it pairs well, if you like the blue and gold look, then uh, 
Shasta sulfur flower buckwheat or just sulfur flower buckwheat is um, a fantastic buckwheat for some spring yellow. I love it compared and then paired with the Ceanothus to get that blue and gold look in the, in the spring. Um, bladder pod has become one of my favorites as well. It's a desert type of plant. Um, it does very, very well in the Central Valley because of with our heat, it can handle clay. Um, I think it can handle sand, uh, sandy soils as well because it's generally found in washes in the desert. Blooms periodically on and off throughout the year. It has a really interesting trunk structure, kind of a funky smell to it. Uh, it's a member of the pea family, but uh, fantastic pollinator attractor. Hummingbirds, bees love it. And um, it's a really fun, kind of a fun plant to put in. The same thing with penstemon. Uh, there's a lot of different penstemons. There's a foothill penstemon. This particular one in the picture is showy penstemon. There's uh, desert penstemons. Almost all of them do really well here in the valley with very little supplemental help. Um, and then my absolute favorite for pollinators um, is California buckwheat. This thing, um, I think in my yard right now, I think I've got six species of buckwheat growing just because I'm enamored with these things. Um, it wasn't until I planted buckwheat that I started getting some of the best little flies, wasps, really cool little critters coming to the plants. And buckwheat is what really brought them into the yard before, after I, I tried a bunch of other things, had other plants growing, but not until I put buckwheat in did I start getting all these little guys. And I just love them. They bloom pretty much all summer into fall. Um, they'll turn rusty brown in the, in the fall and winter. And then you can deadhead them if you want, or just let them self prune and bounce back the next year. It just really depends what you want to do. Um, this is another good example of one that um, don't listen to the published data because they say they get about three to four feet. And I found in my yard where they touch down, they will root themselves and they'll grow to five to eight feet if you let them. So they do need a little bit of um, care if you want to keep them in check or if you have a smaller space. But in general, they're very well behaved and I love them for the value they bring to the habitat. And then lastly, I just wanted to share this one because this is a plant that to me is at the epitome of something that does not belong in the valley. And I normally would never plant this in the valley or recommend it, um, but it's called um, fuchsia flower gooseberry. And the picture on the right is what it looks like in December, January, as it's coming into full bloom. And it gets these beautiful fuchsia flowers on it. And it's in, hummingbirds love it. It's a fantastic plant, it's gorgeous. It's the nastiest thorny thing I've ever seen. It's the thing will stab you in a heartbeat. Um, I always joke that if you have a, a daughter, you wanna plant this under her window, nobody will come in. Um, but if you look at the picture on the left, as soon as it gets above 80 degrees, it goes into dead stick mode and says, I'm done, I'm going to sleep. Wake me up when it cools down again. And so all summer, the leaves persist and it's this brown dead looking thing in the middle of my front yard. Um, but I have to, and the first year I put it in, I thought I killed it. And I had just had to wait, I had to be patient. And sure enough, as soon as it cooled down and we got rain, it immediately flushed back out and turned green and it's beautiful. Um, but you have to deal with that seasonality. And this to me is really the epitome of California. Uh, I was talking to somebody from Santa Clara chapter a few years ago and she had a great, way of looking at things. She said that to a native plant, a California summer is the equivalent of a Minnesota winter. And I always loved that quote. And it's true, especially with this plant, as soon as it gets too hot, it says, I'm done. I'm going to sleep, wake me up later. And so I think trying to adapt and get ourselves around that idea and embrace that California seasonality is huge in our success. And the idea of planting local and planning for success. And with that, I thank you very much. A little bit quick, but that worked out. I'll open it up for questions. Hey, hey Jim, um, I gotta say, the chat has been very, very busy. So, um, <laughs> and unfortunately I've been sitting here working on trying to get uh, it organized so that I can run through it really quickly. Um, so we had a lot of comments that I'd like to run through just to, to at least get everybody who, um, so you have people from all over. Um, Molly from Redwood Chapter says Carpinteria Californica is her favorite this week. Yep. Um, she has a native plant garden and has designed her landscape gardens with at least 80% natives. I forget, did, did you actually talk about 80%, 70%, stuff like that? Um, 
like I said, I wasn't able to to listen very well. I'm gonna have to listen to the your video all over again. Um, I don't remember what I said either. Barbara from Redbud Chapter loves elegant Clarkia. George from San Bernardino Chapter loves California buckwheat. Virginia is looking forward to implementing the design the two of you worked on out as, uh, and by the way, so do I, because I, I was lucky enough to have you come by my house and take a look at my garden and I've got a bunch of plans now on what I can do. Um, Lori Lusk is a San Joaquin County Master Gardener, um, which we love to hear, by the way. Rod, Rhonda, um, our friend who runs the La Loma Native Garden, is also a Stanislaus County Master Gardener, and it's great to have Master Gardeners involved in our organization. Janet from Santa Clara Valley, um, favorite plants are uh, Arctiostaplus, and I love uh, Manzanitas too. Uh, Sandy is a Placer County Master Gardener, and she has native plants. Constance is a Master Gardener, CNPS member, and she loves Ceanothus. Um, Barb is in Stockton, favorite plant is Ceanothus, and though she has yet to get one, and she's getting ready to turn her front yard into mostly native plants. John is from Oakdale, longtime member of CNPS and has a mix of native natives scattered around his place. And Rhonda loves buckwheats and says that they're one of the best pollinator plants at the La Loma Native Garden. Linda had a couple of subjects of interest that uh, maybe you can uh, look at. Keeping weeds at bay um, and pruning things once they are spent. Um, and she has a native garden. So um, do you have any uh, information on just keeping weeds at bay in general? And that's a tough one in our area. Um, I mean, just the wind blows in every invasive thing you can possibly imagine. You know, I, I spent uh, at least two, two, some, two springs trying to get uh, rat tail fescue out of my yard and I just can't keep up with it. It comes back every spring and it just, um, I tried doing a wildflower patch and it just got inundated with invasive grasses and, and other weeds that broadleaf weeds and things that came in. So it's really, um, it comes down to thick layer of mulch, you know, three to four inches. Don't bother with an, one inch or just one layer of bark or whatever. It's, it's got to be at least three to four inches of mulch. And that won't keep all the weeds down. They'll still grow through it, but hopefully it keeps them down enough where they're easy either to hand pull or spot spray or whatever you need to do, um, you won't be just completely overwhelmed by weeds. Um, and my yard, I have some areas that are actually, my, some of my soil is a little bit hydrophobic and so nothing grows there. And, but in areas even with a fairly thick layer of mulch, I still do get a few weeds that pop up from time to time. Um, that was part, what was the second part of that? It was- uh, I was pruning, pruning things once they are spent. Oh yeah, so basically generally, um, my experience has been, and, and again, you can go into Las Feliz and some different resources that might have some ideas about uh, maintenance and pruning. Um, certain natives don't like being pruned really far back into hardwood, like some salvias I've heard. Um, if you prune them too far back into hardwood, they won't bounce back from it. So generally try to do um, light tip pruning if you can. Um, deadheading is fine, especially with um, things like the buckwheats or the salvias, things like that. Ceanothus, I found, actually can take a pretty hard cut and will bounce back from it eventually. Um, it just really depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to get shape out of it or if you're trying just to get rid of the spent flowers, then I would say deadheading first and then go deeper into it if you're trying to get it off of a sidewalk or get space or do something more architectural with it. Um, just, just to throw in the idea, um, because this is stuff you might be able to Google because I don't think we have time to co really cover it right now, but uh, another, some other weed uh, ideas are sheet mulching with cardboard, socialization, solarization with uh, plastic, but you have to have really UV resistant plastic. Um, and then there's, uh, if you're trying to get rid of weeds before you put down a garden, one thing you do is go through and just hoe it all out and then water it in order to allow all the seeds to come back up, then hoe them out again and keep doing that until uh, you don't have quite as many seeds and stuff like that. So, um, and then uh, you could also do a pre-emergent if you um, if you need to to help reduce the seed bank. If you're not opposed to herbicides and chemicals, 
you could put down a pre-emergent, um, water that in, put it under the mulch, and that'll help knock down some of the seeds, but you can't plant through it immediately. You've got to wait about six months to plant through it. I know what a pre-emergent is, but do you want to tell everybody else what it is just in case they don't know? Oh, it's, um, it's a chemical. I don't, I don't know all the science behind it, but it basically is a chemical that, that breaks down the seed. Um, so any seeds that are in the ground, it basically breaks them down and doesn't allow them to germinate. Right. I think I got that close anyway. Right, pre-emergent as opposed to a post-emergent like Roundup, which kills things that are already on the ground. So uh, pre-emergent, a good pre-emergent, you're supposed to be able to just literally put it over the top of plants and because they're already up, they don't, they don't get affected. That, that's the, the plan anyway. Um, and then uh, Kathy says, uh, I love all pollinator plants, especially roses, lantana and lavender. I would love to learn more about planting wildflowers and how to keep weeds down. Um, and I think we ought to point out that not all roses are good pollinator plants. Uh, um, I'm trying to keep up with you when the chat, there was one here um, I wanted to hit the, um, let's see, just lost it, sorry. It's okay. The California wild rose, which is our native rose, is a good pollinator plant. It is. Um, and again, it's, you know, the, the ro roses are, it depends on your definition of pollinator too. Roses do attract some pollinators, but they don't really attract the, they don't attract the second generation and they don't really perpetuate the idea of, of attracting pollinators. Um, so the tea roses and more ornamental roses, again, those you'd plant because you like the aesthetic and they're more of a human value than an insect value or habitat value plant. Right. I've got I've got more questions. Um, Linda asked about keeping weeds at bay and how to. Oh, the, I've already got that one. Sorry. Uh, Melanie uh, said she'd like to know if there is a list of keystone plants from the California Central Valley area, and she lives in Escalon, uh, which is between Stockton and Modesto. That's a good question. Um, I'd have to defer that to a botanist. I'm, Okay. Uh, darn it, Jim. I'm an engineer, not a botanist. <laughs> uh, Jean says she loves Cianothus, lives in Stockton, and is in the process of installing a native landscape in front her in her front yard, 2,800 square feet. Um, she hopes to get pointers on design and maintenance and watering in our area. So, like I said, um, hope uh, if you have any others. I mean, I don't know. If you, you probably that's basically the, what you were talking about the whole time, but. Yeah, I mean, and each, and that's what's interesting. You know, it's there isn't one size fits all for most of these things. It's it's really site specific, and you have to look at your resources. What's what's your soil like? What do you have to work with? And I think it and it's each one's kind of unique. Every yard, I, I never put. I, I kind of have the a foundation of probably five or six plants I put in every design I do. It's like buckwheats, fuchsias, um, ceanothus if I can. Um, Penstemons, that kind of thing, and then I'll I'll branch out from there and, and try other things if the site uh, will support it. If the site doesn't support it and doesn't make sense, I won't put it in. But um, it really depends on the actual site, and so it'll be you're free to come. We can if somebody if they want to contact me offline, we can have a chat um, in person. And again, for as part of the Garden Ambassador Program with CMPS. I'm happy to have a chat with anybody. We can, um, I can come by, look at their yard, and just you know wave my hands around. And we can talk a little bit about it. And if there's no design involved, that's really part of the outreach we do with CMPS and the Garden Ambassador Program. So I'm happy to offer that if uh, if needed. And if it evolves into a full blown design, then we can talk about that and what that entails later. Um, one thing Christine had a question about the name of the plant that was in my garden that dries out and goes into dead stick mode and then comes back to life in the winter. And that is um, called fuchsia flowered gooseberry. Um, Claudia from Witten, uh, whose favorite uh, plant is the Achillea meliofolium, the California yarrow, a common yarrow. Um, she'd like to get ideas on how to start a native garden. Uh, you may have already, that's pretty much what you've been covering, but. Um, you know, I mean, that's what, kind of what we're here for. And if, again, if, um, if you want to contact me offline, I'd be happy to, um, um, I guess I, I don't know if my contact information came up. It was on the last slide, but I kind of got off that last slide pretty fast. So um, I'll uh, put my, 
email address in the chat. Um, so if anybody has any questions offline, they're welcome to get a hold of me. And um, um, Amber from Modesto says she'd like local regional pollinators in her yard, and she has aster babies, milkweed, and topped lavender. Um, do you have any other ideas? Um, I mean, if you have room for it to me, again, for pollinator value in general, buckwheat is fantastic. So California buckwheats would be one of my starting points. Um, actually, up at Blossom Hill Natives, Carl sells one that I've just really fall in love with the last couple of years and it's called santa cruz island buckwheat again not native to the valley um but it tends to do seems at least so far in my yard um it's been doing really well and it has a pink blossom instead of a white blossom but i think mixed mixed together those look really really awesome together and just a di totally different form and habit too um so architecturally they kind of work together but um anything in the buckwheat family is probably one of the best foundation plants for getting going with pollinators. And by Carl, you mean Carl Hill, who owns uh, Blossom Hill Natives up in Oakdale? Yes, sir. And uh, Barb says for Bermuda grass, what kind of herbicide? Oh, I'm basically round, Roundup, which everybody, you know, depending on your school of thought is yay or nay, but um, yeah, pretty much you got to nuke it. There's really not much other choice. You can try to dig it out by hand, but you've got to go 18 inches deep. Um, I did see somebody put in the chat, I don't know if it was Cynthia or somebody said that, you know, they tried to, they had Bermuda, they got tried to get rid of Bermuda with a sod cutter and then um, ended up coming around all around the concrete. And what I always recommend to, if you're going to do sod removal and uh, turf removal, um, I always recommend if you, from the hardscape, go down to the depth of the concrete, so you're down at least three to four inches at the edge of the concrete and then slope it, gen, gently slope it back up about 18 inches into your yard. So what it does is it that four inch ledge at the concrete creates a natural edging for the bark. So you have three inches of coverage of bark at the concrete without it spilling over onto the concrete. And you don't have to put in a plastic edge strip or anything else. And then by creating a nice little slope, then you can um, gradually bring it up and you don't end up with this ledge at the end of your sidewalk um hey, but that Jim, helps yeah i just wanted to comment on that since you're answering my question um yeah i tried to do that but the ground was so hard and the area was four thousand over four thousand square feet that i just couldn't <laughs> but i mean i knew that that bermuda grass was going to sneak out around the the uh the edges and i'm actually attacking it right now but in the middle there's almost nothing um, and it really didn't come up. So I, I feel that it has worked. Someone, but here's a question. I don't know if anyone's tried this, but someone just told me on that this is in the native plant group or maybe the Sacramento native plant group, but that um, hot wa boiling water will kill Bermuda grass, grass. Now, of course, you can't do this on 4,000 square feet, but maybe I could do that along the, the oh. edges of the sidewalk. Has anyone tried that? Um, I've never tried it. Let's we'll see if anyone, start. anybody in the chat has. I'll just put it in the chat if you have. I guess. Um, I put um, the you see. Well, put... well, let me say one other. Let me say one other thing, um, please. So uh, George Zhang just said part, uh, cardboard mulch in the summer to remove the Bermuda glass. So I did that. If you're getting a rebate from the agency, reach out to them. Um, so actually, I wrote an article in our newsletter about the um, rebates that are available for those of us in the San Joaquin Valley that I could find. So, you know, in the various cities here, uh, Modesto, Turlock, Patterson, um, I'm not saying they all had them, but that's, I researched all of those. And if you go back to, to I think it was our first newsletter, you can find my article on that. I don't know how you have, at, Mike, how did they get a hold of the first newsletter? Is it on our website? How, how do they get a hold of who? Our first newsletter. Oh, oh well, our, I I'd have to I can try and send it to them. I mean, if they need it. But I'm I'm just suggesting they read my article about what, what oh, the different oh, cities right. provide. Um. Anybody? That, that maybe. That, go ahead. Anybody who wants it, just let, let me know, and I can send out the first newsletter to whoever would like to read it. And I can send it to you, by the way, Cynthia, if you want. 
Oh, but, yeah, I've got it. I've got it somewhere. And, and I know that uh, we're planning on putting all these things on our website, but I, that's a slow process. You know, that's a good point because um, we also have uh, articles that we are putting up um, on the website right. and stuff like this. So um, we can talk about that too. All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I kind of jumped in here and started talking, which not everybody gets to do. So I feel that was a little bit unfair. We have more questions. Or, taking right? advantage of your my, position. I know. <laughs> my, yeah. We have, I know we, I've seen more questions. I don't think we've gone to them all. You want uh, to right, yeah. Let me, go on there? Um, I, I was just going to say that the Bermuda, I put the UCIPM in there. But the first thing that they say is it's really hard to deal with Bermuda. Um, Maxine was saying, what would be a sensitive, a sensible, viable ratio of native to non-native plants or zone adjacent plants in a design for a suburban front garden? That's basically 70 or 80 percent is usually what we recommend. Um, so it depends on who you talk to. Um, Xerxes Society would... Um, they, uh, the like pollinator posse recommends 70 um Zerus society is recommending 80 um but basically uh if if you can do that if if you can't just put it in as many as you can um and let's see just uh let's see george uh says there is a dead zone for most salvia if you cut into the dead zone it will not break bud so you can take a stem of salvia back to the last visible node. Right. Um, he also says, but don't go to very last visible node. A few nodes are safer. Rhonda says, what do you recommend for how much to prune an apricot mallow? I'm trying to figure that I have a bush mallow and an apricot mallow in my yard. They ended up flopping over onto my sidewalk. So I um, I tried going light one year and then they still, within the first season, they grew about three, two feet and flopped over on the sidewalk again. So um, this year they uh, made me mad. So I gave them a massive haircut and trimmed them way back hard. So I'll let you know in the spring. <laughs> Jeannie asks, what mulch do you recommend for native plants? Um, it depends. Um, so if you're going with woodland species, then I recommend bark mulch. Um, if you're going with more desert type plants, then more of a rock mulch would be appropriate. So you really, you, again, same as the soil conditions, same as the water requirements, you match the, uh, the mulch to the plant community, you match the plant to the plant community, same thing. And um, my personal preference, I've been using uh, walk-on bark for years. I just, um, the gorilla hair or the, the shredded cedar is good for keeping insects and stuff down and, and things I've heard. But I've also, I think I tried it once and it tended, when I tried it, it seemed to form an extremely dense, thick mat and weeds actually rooted into it. And it was really hard to shovel through and to work around after a first couple of years. It just, just worked itself into a big, thick mat. Um, I like the walk-on bark because it's a really mixed shred size. I really don't like that big chunk bark that looks like rafts. That stuff floats and just doesn't do any good and it's too big. Um, Walk-on bark has a mix of some really small stuff, pea-sized stuff, all the way up to some chunks. And um, it may not be the, the most aesthetically pleasing thing in the world, but it works really well. It breaks down over time. It does uh, tend to break down. It helps build the soil. Uh, but it also is very easy to rake out of the way and either weed or plant through and then push back into place very simply. So I just like it. It, it doesn't float and generally is easy to work around. Uh, George points out there's um, Mike. Hey, Mike. Mike, let, let me just say a few things um, because then in this recording, uh, people can't see the chat and the recording. So I want to mention some things I put in the chat. So there's oh, always. I was always going to be doing that as we go. Oh, no, but let me just say that that, that uh, we've done two other webinars on gardening. Uh, one is by Carl Hill, who's uh, the uh, proprietor of Blossom Hill Natives, and uh, Carl does a great talk specifically for our area of which plants to plant. And he has some information on his website too, Blossom Hill Natives. And Carl, Carl uh, put a note in the chat. The other talk was by Christoph Kozinski of the Santa Clara Valley CMPS. And his, the title of his talk is Reliable 
California native plants for a garden with no irrigation, which was really interesting for me because I don't have any irrigation. I didn't put in any uh, irrigation. So um, both of these are available on our, in our um, YouTube channel. So we're gonna have now a kind of a trio of great uh, articles about gardening with native plants. Okay, Mike. George points out that there's a window to apply uh, pre-emergent herbicides. Soil temperatures are the key. The instruction is on the label, follow the label, label is the law. Molly says, don't forget to leave bare spaces for native ground bees, which is really important. 70% of all native bees are um, ground nesting bees and we do not leave a lot of room for them to nest, especially near the gardens where we actually expect them to get their food. Uh, Cal Amber says, Calscape is a good resource and that is really true. There's a lot of information on calscape.org. Um, and then uh, Cynthia points out, uh, you, you just mentioned that, right? Um, I'd like to point out right. that right. uh, Hillary says, wanting to preserve caterpillars and beautiful butterflies, what do you say about BT if you have uh, coding, uh, oh, coddling moth prop, looks like she cut off in the middle of her sentence. What do you say about BT? I'm not really well versed in herbicides. I don't generally use herbicides, except um, I do have uh, pest control that comes out when we spray a, a perimeter just around the living space, just to keep nasties from getting inside the, inside the house into my world. But basically outside of a, a three foot perimeter around the edge of the house, I let everything go. If I've got ants, if I've got whatever's growing and thriving out in the yard, spiders, whatever it is, if they're out in their world, I leave them there. So I don't really, I can't speak to uh, So very much. quickly, I looked up coddling moth on UCIPM. They do have a, uh, a whole thing on it. So um, I would recommend going there for information on that. Um, Rhonda says for sure one keystone plant is the oak tree, which is true. Oh, yeah. Because that's Absolutely. what I Most, unfortunately, most uh, suburban yards can't accommodate a valley oak um, or even a live oak, which would normally be found here. If you've got the space for an oak tree, by all means, that should be the first thing you think about planting. They're going to be the best ever habitat plant you can put in your yard. John points out elderberry are really good too. Um, they tend to want more water. I have found they tend to be a little bit more riparian um, to be happy. Um, but And they get huge. They'll get to 25 plus feet if you let them. So um, just be cautious with those. If you've got the space for them, again, great plant. You can use the berries, but yeah, you got to have... Uh, I'd have space. Brooke just converted her. Um, hey, and Mike, let me say something also. I actually, the talk that Rhonda Allen gave on the um, La Loma Native Plant Garden also has a lot of good advice for gardeners, although her focus was more on how she made it happen, and it's absolutely fascinating. And that is, of course, recorded in, in our channel. But Rhonda, one thing that you said that really hit home to me was when you were talking about pollinators, you said, I hope that you remember this, the best pollinator is actually sunflowers. And I've got a bunch of sunflowers out back and that is so true. They're, they're just all kinds of little tiny bees are buzzing around them. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Uh, please speak out or type it, you have to type it. Uh, Brooke just converted her lawn to 90% California natives, but the landscaping company put down weed barrier. She discovered sheet mulching after the fact. Will rhizomes still spread and grow? Yes, maybe. I, I've seen Bermuda and bindweed um, entwine themselves and grow three or four feet wide mm -hmm. under plastic mulch. Uh, George says, start small. Your plants and your wallet will love you. Um, Jen, then you gave your, uh, your email address in the chat and then... Uh, George said, "Cardboard mulching on the salt in the summer to remove Bermuda lawn. If you're getting re rebate for the from the agency, reach out to them. There's an allowed period, but you can file extensions if you cardboard mulch." Um, and then uh, Carl said, "The plants on your website work in our region. There is also a list of plants that did not work in our demonstration garden." Um, and then he gave uh, a, um, a link, um, and uh, so that, that's in chat. Uh, Chris, 
let's see. I'm trying to find more questions. Uh, uh, is uh, work on bark? Uh, let's see. Native. Sorry, I'm trying to go through the. Oh, that that was actually the last one. Cool. So. Maybe one one thing I'd like to point out real quickly is, um, so one thing that I do when I do designs for people, really, um, like you mentioned Calscape, there's a lot of resources online and a lot of homeowners I've talked to really seem, they get overwhelmed quickly by the, just the sheer number of plants. And if you just type in, even if you try to narrow it down by your zip code or looking at the resources that show you what grows in your area, it's still really hard to know what those all mean and how how they work together and which ones are appropriate. And so my goal really if i'm helping somebody get started is is not to come up with the end all be all solution it's really just to narrow down the plant palette and to give that person enough information and enough inspiration to pick up the ball run with it and really research those plants and and get them started get them off a of top dead center and then hopefully they would that person would take the design tweak it make it their own and turn it into something that that reflects what they want to get out of the yard. All right, I guess so. We're around eight twenty. Uh, um, I think Rhonda says asters are good pollinator plants for both bees and butterflies. They provide nectar and pollen. Uh, golden kern is great too. Hummingbirds will feed on it. Besides many of the bees, salvias are on an all around great choice for pollinators. Um, and uh, Cynthia pointed out free tree mulch from Chip Drop. And uh, Ron also said, I also find coyote mint is attractive to bees. So, anyway, uh, there you go. Thank you, everybody. Cynthia. It's all yours. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for having me. Okay. Hey, Carl, yeah. are you closed? In, are you closed until uh, October? Yeah, we're officially closed till October. We just found well, we um, we're not that large of a nursery, but summer is a bad time to plant natives. Most natives are dormant. Um, and it's very hard to plant them during summer and be successful. Fall's a great planting time. Uh, so we take some time off. Well, we propagate a lot of plants uh, during this time of year, and then we open back up in October when the weather starts to become more favorable. So I'm having a, a little bit of success with my, um, my propagation, but we'll see what actually happens. I lost all my service berry, which was the, my no. best. Yeah, they're all. Ooh, I wanted one. <laughs> yeah, I I had a lot of, but but I mean, you know, I can always go back to Al's house and get more uh, more clippings. Hey, so. Carl, there's your next job: propagate yeah. service berry for me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll put it on the list, Rhonda. Okay, I'll try that. I'll try that in. Uh, I'll try that again in, uh, in October. Yeah, well, um, we learn every year, Mike. Yeah, and then, um, but but there are others that are coming along. Um, so, uh, I, I I unfortunately I don't know that any of it's stuff you don't have. It probably is all stuff you already have. Yeah. But I'm just trying to learn. So yeah, sure. I think, yeah, uh, I mean, Mike, yeah. I want to uh, mention something, which is several people have asked in the chat. Well, you know, will this be recorded? And the answer is yes, it is being recorded right now. And it will be on our YouTube channel, which is at NSJP North South Working Valley <clears throat> underscore CNPS. So it'll take me a few days to put this up, but then it will be there for your, uh, so you can revisit it and send it to people. Um, and then there was another question from Linda. How about dead poppies? What do you, uh, she, and she says, she, should you pull them out? That's not what I do, but I want to hear what Jim does, what Jim suggests. Poppies. Oh, poppies. Um, I generally let them go to seed and then pull them because it's just um, my front yard right now is about 80 percent. Well, not 80. There's a couple sections of it that were this spring were probably yeah 80 percent poppies and clarkia. And as soon as they are done and go to seed, 
I just, it's the sea of dead brown that um, I just need to get rid of before everybody starts lighting fireworks off. So I generally um, go through and rip out, um, I either just break them off and leave the roots in the ground or if I have to pull them, I pull them. But if you let them go to seed, there's such a dense seed bank anyway that you're going to get 8,000 poppies the next year, whether you leave them in the ground or not. That's so, what I mainly do. Yep. Hey, I have a question for Jim and Carl. Are you there, Carl? I'm here. I am working on a project for the Master Gardeners, and I we're putting on a workshop October 7th out at the Ag Building, and I'm working on this idea of calling it a reinventing your backyard or reimagining what your backyard could be with native plants to kind of give people a way to um, think about if they were doing lawn replacement, what what are they looking at <laughs> and what are some options? And I would really love it if you two guys would help me, um, maybe Jim with some sharing some design ideas with what plants you would use and Carl with maybe giving some little plants as um, examples of what they look like to provide for the workshop to show okay. people. Uh, yeah. And maybe we would actually go out into the pollinator garden at the ag building that we have developed and show them the proper way to plant a native plant in the ground, mm -hmm. if we had a few examples. So anyway, I was hoping you two might be, I know it's a busy time of year, uh, but maybe somehow sure, you can. Sure, Rhonda. Um, yeah, we, can, we can talk yeah. about that as we get closer. Okay. Rhonda, let, let me just mention that um, there actually are videos of Carl teaching kids how to plant native plants because we uh, we um, installed a native plant garden at the Oakdale post office. And, well, I actually uh, want during, to demonstrate uh, doing it with the people, you know, right there on site. Yeah, but let, let, me, let me just finish. Let me just finish. So um, if you go to the I, Oakdale post office on, uh, uh, on yeah, Google think Maps, for, you, I, can, you can find those videos. Yeah, I think for all our guests, <laughs> we, we should take this to a local meeting. Yeah, are we uh, still recording? Venue? Yeah. Still recording. Okay. So, but Jim, thanks for the um, design. This design aspect of this has been a total mystery to me. <laughs> I like the plants. I like propagating. I like planting. But designing, come on. So it's it's. Uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate your expertise. Yeah. yeah. That's why. Yeah. A, okay, Jim. Yeah, we're gonna wind up now because we always end right at eight thirty. That's when I stop the recording. So um, I want to thank Jim, and I'm sure everybody else wants to also thank him for a great presentation. Um, and it'll be it'll be on the YouTube channel. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording now. Thank you. Bye. All right, Carl. That's why we. Uh...